name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. So we are continuing our conversation here. And uh, today's class is going to be on uh, how to be a parishioner. And <clears throat> we're going to go a little bit in a, in a sideways direction, but we'll get to where we need to be because this is obviously a very vast uh, topic, but it's important always to have background to this. And background is very important because it helps us kind of put in perspective of what we're trying to think and what we're trying to do. So... Um, Anyway, I wanted to start with a, a quote from my doctoral thesis. Um, it, it was a fascinating study. I, I studied three parishes and about evangelism and the different things. And I had questionnaires and surveys and all sorts of stuff. But there was a quote that someone had given me in an interview. And it was one that I, I always sort of, it stuck in my mind. So I want to start with this. So this is a quote. It's unattributable. Any parish that starts with the holy experiment, as the father, talking about the priest, is taught, everything has to be synergistic with the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. If you are truly have a group of friends who are Christian and they love God, and I think it's a mutual thing, they love the priest and the priest loves them, but their priest also loves God and is able to articulate the doctrines and the teachings of the church, then you're going to have fertile ground where the holy experiment will blossom. And that's what happened here, referring to this parish. And I think it's relevant to any group, any ethnic group, age group, or people's group within the United States. It's got to plant the seeds in the ground where it's going to grow. And so my brothers and sisters, uh, when we start talking about how to be a parishioner, I think that's a good place for us to start. You know, what what is this holy experiment, as, as this person put it, is? You know, what does it mean to, to be in this parish, to be in this um church and and to allow um this sort of experiment to find fertile ground and it it of course it starts and first and foremost with the blessings that god puts upon a community as the bishop says when he when he serves the divine liturgy at a particular parish you know uh lord bless this vine which you have planted with your right hand and so it starts there but it also goes deeper to that because as this person kind of uh, intimates is that it, it becomes an important part of how we as a parishioner, as we a member of the body of Christ, as we as, as that, that person, how we participate in that. Certainly the parish has its, its foundation and its context and all those sort of important things. But our participation in that is critically important. We can't be passive on that. I, I often explain to people, you know, orthodoxy is not a passive faith. It's an active faith. Living the spiritual life is not a passive thing where we just sort of, oh, I think about God. It actually requires us to do something. It requires us to be a participant in our life and in the life of the church. And when we are not doing that by brothers and sisters, then we can go off into a kind of a, a direction that at can be very nihilistic or it can even be very deluding. And so it's critically important that we understand that we have to be involved. We have to be active. You know, we don't talk about prayer. We pray. We don't talk about fasting. We fast. You know, we don't talk about, you know, the liturgy. We do the liturgy. And so I think that's incredibly important for us to understand where we are when we start to say how to be a parishioner. In other words, how are you going to be part of this? Not how this is going to be part of you. One of the things that I, I often remind uh, the seminarians that I teach is, you know, you don't change the church. The church changes you. It gives you, it makes you something different. It completes you. It makes you um, something that you didn't even expect you were going to be such a short time ago. And over your lifetime, you grow and you change and you move and it becomes more and more critical in, in, in how you live your life. Um, that's why we don't talk about spirituality in the Orthodox Church. We talk about the spiritual life. Um, and likewise, we, you know, when we are involved in our own life and the life of the parish, then it becomes something much more deep and, and set and it becomes a way of life. Our 
rhythm of life becomes fused to the church's rhythm of life. And all of that leads us to a, a deeper uh, relationship with Christ and with his church. And so I wanted to kind of start there. Um, one of the things we're still working through is, is Hopko's book, Speaking the Truth of Love. And um, in one of his articles, uh, The Work of the Christian Laity is actually a title of one of his articles. And, and we're going to draw from that uh, some important points during this discussion. So I'm quoting from his article. These parishes, certainly in the United States and Canada, Canada, will be of a great variety of size, shapes, and styles. Though each one, theologic and mystically, will be the very same Church of Christ. The parish will be, co be, co be composed of different kinds of people. They will be of different cultures and traditions. They will have different emphasis and possibilities in worship and education, pastoral care, and philanthropic and evangelical activity. None of them will claim they can do everything by themselves. All of them will admit that they need each other, being constrained by truth and love to cooperate for God's glory and the good of God's people. They will all confess that they do God's work. They cannot compete with each other, but they must compete, complete each other in Christian service and ministry. And they will know that the only way in which they will strive to outdo each other is, in ex is expressing godly zeal, brotherly affection, honor, and mutual respect. And so that's incredibly important for us to understand that each of these communities that we live in, you know, they have a different context. And that's a reality. You know, a, a church in Wappinger Falls, New York, has a context that may be different than a church in Macon, Georgia, or in Tacoma, Washington, or wherever it may be. But yet it's the same church. And so we have to understand that. And, and certain churches and parishes will have different emphasis uh, and, and things. But ultimately, they all need to be the same. You know, they all need to be part of that body of Christ as the Orthodox define that. And so uh, and the only way that we, we compete against each other as Orthodox parishes, even if you're in that same area, is trying to outdo each other, as, as Father Hopko says, in service and in ministry. And uh, godly zeal, brotherly affection, honor, and mutual respect. Isn't that a wonderful way to think about it? You know, we, we don't believe in sheep stealing, though it, it sadly happens, you know. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that's how we work with each other. Uh, Archbishop Anastasio, this is, I have two more quotes I want to do, and then we're going to get into the meat of the subject. So Archbishop Anastasio, who I talked about last week, is an incredible missionary, uh, incredible leader of the Albanian church, and his book, um, Mission in Christ's Ways, is absolutely recommended reading. And he says, the local church, the diocese, the parish, but also every other form of expression of ecclesial life, such, such as monasteries, religious organizations, missionaries, societies, various small and forming missionary groups and communities, consistently remain open and fulfill their duty within society to radiate the love of and glory of Christ to the whole of humanity for the sake of the entire human race, the economy, always receiving and offering the gospel. And that's really the foundation where we begin on how to be a, a parishioner is, you know, whatever we are doing in that parish, is it offering the gospel of Christ? And are we receiving the gospel of Christ? I mean, that should be without thinking what it is. I mean, we're a church, right? That's that's the whole point of it. Otherwise, it's a club or whatever. But the, but if we're not offering and receiving that gospel of Christ, my brothers and sisters, then we are on a wrong path. And, and no matter how we define ourselves, that has to be at the heart of it. And finally, I'm going to quote, quote from uh, David Bosch is a famous uh, Protestant missionary writer, an academic, um, quite famous in his books, um, Transforming Mission is his classic book. And uh, he actually spends a chapter talking about orthodoxy in his book, and it's really uh, fascinating. And I think he's right on target on how he explains orthodoxy, um, not necessarily from, from a point of view of, of how he places it in a, in a historical sense, but uh, nonetheless, it's important. But in orthodox perspective, he says, mission is thus centripetal rather than centrifugal, organic rather than organized. It proclaims the gospel through doxology and liturgy. 
the witness the witnessing community is the community of worship and in fact the worshiping community is and of itself an act of witness so what is he saying there and this is a point that's very important you know we are brought in you know, centripetal and centrifugal forces you know forces that draw you in and forces that draw you out and ultimately that liturgy that participation in the in the life of the church draws you in it draws you into a deeper relationship with the church so it should be constantly bringing us in but that drawing in should then be sending us out it, it, you know we, we we come in to be sent out we we bring ourselves together into a deeper understanding of, of God, of Christ, of the church, of his gospel, all those things, so that we can in turn go out and live it, not only live it, but go and spread it, spread the gospel. And that's an incredibly important thing. And again, when we're a parishioner, we must always be thinking in terms, how am I being drawn in so that I can be sent out? And by the way, by being sent out, then we draw other people in who are then sent out. And it's that wonderful, beautiful action. So that's why, the, you know, the church is so central to our understanding. You know, how to be a parishioner, well, you have to start with the parish, right? What does it mean to be in the parish? And certainly you can read the statutes and it gives you all the, all the you know, what it means to be a, a, a member in good standing. But if we're going to start with that parish, then a, a few points need to be made. A parish has to be theologically and liturgically sound. You know, in other words, what you see is going to be orthodox and it's going to be something that is clearly part of that universal church. It must be pastorally applicable. In other words, you know, what we do there must be something that has an effect. You know, we can, we can all do different things and it has no effect locally to the, not only to your people, but to your local community. And so, you know, when you think about the type of things that you're going to be doing, it's got to have that effect. And the priest has to have, be pastorally, pastorally applicable. He needs to know his people. It needs to be a koinonia. We've discussed this many times. It needs to be a communion, a community. It needs to be responsible in all areas of church life. In other words, you know, you must be the way you spend your money, we talked about this last week, the way you do your things, all that stuff has to be responsible and accountable and transparent. It must be responsive to the needs of the parish. You need to know what's going on. You know, to be a parishioner means that you know other people, that you don't live in isolation, but that you know what's going on in the parish and with other people, and you stay in touch with them. It's a family. It must be responsive to the needs of the surrounding community. You need to know where God has planted you. And when one person suffers in that community, you need to be there. And the people in that community need to know that this parish is part of it, that it's not some sort of separate group, but rather it, it, it's planted in a particular place at a particular time by particular people so that it can be that light for those people. And it must be an incarnation of the gospel. In other words, if the parish isn't loving your people, <laughs> I, I know this one priest I um, went to seminary with, and he, he he's down south and he's very southern, and he goes that we're loving the people today. We're really loving the people today, and I think there's just something true about that. You know, we're loving the people, and 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 so we have to do that. You know, you have to love your people. You have to know your people. You have to love one another. You know, as the priest says in the liturgy, with one mind and one heart, let us love one another. One. And, and at best, you know, we have to be constantly be doing that um, because that's really what it means to be part of that parish is, is to love one another, to be of one mind and one heart and to confess Christ. So this responsibility is, is then, you know, placed on both the priest, that person who is chosen to lead that community and the laos or the people who are, you know, part of that community. One cannot be over the other, but yet, you know, one has to lead and, and one has to be able is responsible in different areas of church life so that there's a conciliar nature to it. Um, so it's important for us to understand that that reciprocal relationship between the priest and, and, his, and the people that God has entrusted to him. You know, uh, I, the most serious thing that I have as a priest is the souls of all these people that God has entrusted me. You know, and that you should, as a priest, you need to take that as deadly serious. You know, this is what God 
what I am here. I can serve the liturgy. I can do all these things. But it's ultimately these people's souls for their salvation. And I'm supposed to be to lead them in that sense. But they need to be also be willing to be led. And um, so let's let's talk a little bit on that. Um, so as a priest, and this is directly from Father Hopko's book, he kind of outlines what what's the priest's responsibility. And he, he does it in much more eloquent detail. I'm just going to hit the highlights. So the priest must be the person who gathers the people together. He must be the one who leads the people in worship and in, in spiritual life. He must proclaim the word of God, proclaim the teachings of the church. He must serve in dignity and in good order. He must instruct the faithful on the faith. Never miss an opportunity to do that. Do the sacraments that we have in the church. Care for everyone that God puts before them, whether they're in the church or outside the church, or wherever. But he must care for all people without prejudice, even the people that really can make it difficult for him. He still needs to be able to do that. Um, he needs to lighten their burdens. That's an interesting way to put it. You know, the priest need, is there to lighten the people's burdens, whether it's a spiritual burden, an emotional burden, uh, whatever way that, you know, that, that people come into that parish and they bring these things in. Um, he needs to be able to lighten those burdens in, through counseling and confession and all the different uh, tools that the church gives to him. He must intercede on their behalf. What, and sometimes it's interceding on their behalf on, before others, and sometimes it's interceding on their behalf before them. Um, and he must have the courage to do that. And he must advocate not only for his parish and his community, but the people in there. Um, he needs to be their champion. He needs to be the one who's going to you know, know that they're, they're going to be there, he's going to be there in all the events of their life and all the events of the good and the bad. And so that's the responsibility that's placed on the priest. But as Father Hopko continues, there is another responsibility, and that's placed on, on the laity and what they must do in order to do, to have this beautiful relationship, the symbiotic relationship. They must assist the priest. They must care for the clergy. They must make sure that, the, that, the, that their clergy are properly trained before they're sent there. They must um, encourage the priest. They must support him, not only financially, so that he can you know, do the work of the church, but support him emotionally and, and, and spiritually. And they must follow the priest, not out of a sense of a blind obedience, but out of a sense of love. And uh, that's an incredibly important thing uh, that we, we forget that, you know, sometimes we place the priest versus the parish or the priest versus the laity in such an adversarial role in some cases, in some horrible cases, that it becomes impossible to be either led or to be followed. And so that's an important thing that we have to do. So those are the things that we must do. So we have to do those in a conciliarity, understanding that each person has their unique vocation in the church. You know, a priest must be a priest and a laity must be able to be the laity and not over one another, but in a different way. You know, and, and the responsibilities that the priest had by virtue of his ordination and the laying on of his hands is, is a different responsibility, not any more superior than the responsibility of that laity by virtue of their baptism and chrismation which sets them apart from any other person. There's a hierarchy, but there's a, there's a conciliarity. And a priest cannot be a priest without the people. I can't be a priest on my own. I can't do the service by myself. But the people can't be a church without the priest. So all of those things have to fit beautifully together. As it says in Ephesians 4.10, um, you know, equip the saints for the work of their ministry. And the priest has to equip the saints, in, the, in this case, they're talking about, you know, the people in, in the church for their ministry, not just for his ministry, but for their ministry. And so each of us has that unique ministry in the church, and we have to remember that. So if we're going to be a parishioner, we have to discover what 
our own ministry is in the church, just as the priest has to discover his own ministry within the church. So how do we connect? How do we connect those, those pieces together? We seek each other. We talk to each other. We engage each other. We evaluate each other. We form relationships with each other. We are consistent in how we deal with each other. We discuss, we defend, we love, we be, we be the church. And sometimes we see that particularly one way. The priest is telling the people this is what they need to do. Or sometimes it's the reverse and the people are telling the priest this is what needs to be done. And both of them are wrong. Both of them are wrong. It has to be together. You know, that we form these type of things. Otherwise, it is it's silly, it's silliness, and then it becomes toxic, and we don't want that. So, with that kind of background, uh, understanding where we fit within that church, how do we how do we find out and figure out how to be a parishioner? Besides the obvious things, right? Be, you know, and the obvious things, you know, support financially and and come to the services and do those sort of things. I want to go beyond that. I want us to think about it in a different way. And I, I, I thought a lot about this, like how was I, I was going to approach this discussion. And I decided I start with this this pamphlet that Father Alexander Schmemann wrote. It's a very small pamphlet. Um, and it's uh, the mission of the church is what it's called. And it's a very small pamphlet, again, and you can find it online. And, he's, and he makes three points in it. He said, I am sent to myself. I am sent to my family. I am sent to the world. And I think this is the way for us to start to think about it. Because first and foremost, how to be a parishioner is how am I being sent to myself? How is God living in my life? That's a lifetime of work, by the way, to try to figure that out. And so we need to start there. You know, we're not going to go out there and conquer the world. That Maybe, maybe not. But first and foremost, you have to get yourself in order. And so uh, a good way to do that is Father Hopko's 55 maxims for living a Christian life. I won't go through those. Uh, they're readily available online. I, we spent a year, adult class last year, going in detail over those 55 maxims of living a Christian life. And they are quite remarkable, quite, uh, they're not way over our head. You know, they're very practical, very direct on how to be a Christian. And I think if all of us have a chance to read those 55 maxims of Christian life, of living a Christian life, that answers that question from Father Shemendon. You know, it answers, you know, how is it, how am I being sent to myself? And uh, that's where you start. So if you want to understand how to be a parishioner in a community, you need to first put your own house in order. And as Father Schmemann would say, you know, we are, we are all created to be a doxological and Eucharistic being. So that's, that's what we have to discover within ourselves. And so, you know, find your role, find out what that means to be a doxological, in other words, praising God and Eucharistic, a thanksgiving to God being literally, you know, in the church, in the services, um, but also spiritually and in so many other ways. Find what your role is in that church. Find out what your charism is, your gift. And ultimately, ultimately use it. You know, make it real in your life. As it says, you are God's chosen people. You are Christ's body. This is from the Apostle Paul. You are the Holy Spirit's temple. And that's what we have to realize. In order to become a parishioner, we have to realize that. Make it real. John 6, 28 to 29. And they said to him, what shall we do that we may work, make the work of works of God? And Jesus said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Hear the word of God. Keep it. Perform good deeds. Complete their faith, for faith without works is dead. So my brothers and sisters, that's where we start, right? How do we, how, know that you are a chosen people, that you are God's body, Christ's body, this temple of the Holy Spirit and make it real. 
you know, love God with all your mind, you know, the great commandments, you know, all your mind, all your heart, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's where it starts, you know, and, and, and discover your, your vocation as both as a priest, a prophet, and a king. Isn't that interesting that we say it that way? But it's obvious from the New Testament, from the church fathers, they're always talking about the priesthood of all of us, you know, that we're there to do, to worship God. You know, to be the prophet, to speak the word of God, to be the king, because we are the chosen race of God. And so that's a lifetime of work. And so if you want to understand how to be a parishioner, you need to understand from the very beginning what it means to be a priest, a prophet, and a king in your own life. Now, there are sacramental priests, you know, like myself, who set aside to serve that. But that doesn't mean that we all don't have that priestly, prophetic, and kingly vocation. And so that's how we are sent to ourself. The next one is how am I sent to my family? How am I sent to my family? What is it that I'm supposed to do in my family? Whether you're a mother or a father or however it may be, all of those sort of things are incredibly important because you are called to create a, a house church, you know, that, that your family is a church. In a very real sense, you, you should be praying together. You should be, you know, living that Christian life together. You should be following, the, you know, the church and, and, and you should be an example. We don't often think about that. You know, we don't often think of that. But even within the marriage service itself, it talks about that, creating that church, creating that, that, that church to come together. And it's so important for us. And I think it, as as spouses, husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, grandparents, whatever it may be, if we start thinking of it in terms of how am I making this home, this house, a household of God? How am I making this a place where God can be? That has incredible importance on how you are as a parishioner. Because if you are not living this at home, then it's very difficult to bring it into the church. If you're not actually reinforcing what happens at church at home, I mean, there's nothing that the priest can preach or teach or do to make it real. In other words, you can't abandon that. You know, I, as a priest, you have maybe a few hours a week that you can interact with people. And if it's not being done also at home, if you're not living that life at home, then it's not effective at all. So nonetheless, you have to create that home church. And, and you know, this is difficult because we're, we're all torn in many, many different directions, especially if you have younger children and you have all these different sort of things. But it's if we can reinforce, not just reinforce, but establish the foundation at the home, then it translates absolutely to what you're going to be as a parishioner. Absolutely, and how you're going to live that life, how you're going to approach the priest, how you're going to approach the sacraments, how you're going to approach the liturgy, how you're going to approach the church year, how you're going to approach the world, because it has that foundation in the house. And you know, this is this is difficult for parents, and sometimes you know you, you don't want to make them into little monks and nuns necessarily, and on the other hand, you don't want to let them just sort of get away with everything. And you have to find that 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 wise way. And ultimately, it's about your example. That's why number one is I'm sent to myself. If I'm not living it, I'm, if I'm not practicing what I'm preaching, shall we say, then it's not going to have an effect on anyone else around you. So um, create that. In, in Apostle Paul, in his letter to Timothy, first letter to Timothy 5.8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. <laughs> That's pretty powerful, right? When you're thinking about that, you know, if you're not providing for you as, you know, that's your responsibility as a mother, a father, a husband, a wife, is to provide for one another. And, and, and why, you know, we do that financially. We think about that all the time. How am I going to provide for my family? We even think about that physically, you know, about the safety of our family and taking care of them, make sure they have a roof over their head and all the food in their stomach and all that other stuff. Why would we not also do this spiritually? Why would we not also want to provide for them in that way for their salvation? And that's why we have to do that. We have to kind of you know, have that. 
you know, you, you, you don't want to be someone who, you know, bad mouths the church. At, you know, you go to church and you go and you sit through the services and all this other stuff and you come home and you say, ah, that priest, he would serve a horrible liturgy and all oh, I didn't like his sermon or I don't like him personally or whatever it may be. You have just kind of torn a little bit of, of, the, of a person's soul away from that because, you know, and they may be absolutely right, by the way, but that's not the point, right? Because what the people in the church are not perfect. The church is perfect. The people in there are not. But, you know, it just opens a door and, and it's not a good door. Doesn't mean you have to be this sort of, you know, lemming who follow, you know, fall, you know, goes off the cliff. Not at all. But be careful of your words. Be careful of your actions. You know, make sure they are words of encouragement and love and respect, not anger and division and hate. And if you have that at home, it will translate into you being a parishioner and how you are as a parishioner. It's just a reality. And by the way, the reverse is also true for the priest, right? I mean, the priest is doing that and he comes, oh, this parishioner drove me crazy today and da da da, da or whatever it may be, and starts bad mouthing his people to his family. And that destroys their family. It destroys their relationship with the church. And, uh, I, you know, I've always been very, very careful, my wife and I, about what we talk about in front of our children and, 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 and how we express that, you know, because it, it is dangerous to their souls, not only to ours, by the way, which it can also. So, you know, you, know, you have to have that example, you know, as a priest and as a, as a parishioner and how you do that. And most importantly, I think, that, and this is a one that we don't always think about, but we have to be humble. We have to be humble. There's a wonderful book about raising kids in the church by Sophie Kolenzine. It's very old now, it, it, but it, there's a wonderful passage in there. And it was about, she was reflecting on Forgiveness Sunday and how her father would ask forgiveness in front of them. And here was their father, you know, the father's, you know, bigger than life you know, and, and for kids. And he was humbling himself, getting on his knees and asking forgiveness of his children. That's pretty powerful when you think about that. That's, that's an incredibly powerful way in which we forget about. You know, that's why Forgiveness Sunday is so important in the church, for the priest to ask forgiveness of the parish, the parish to ask forgiveness of the priest, and everyone to ask forgiveness of one another. It's very powerful. And, you know, then, and when, uh, you know, my kids would come up, I would get choked up in my wife because we know that we wronged each other in some ways during the year. And so how do we, you know, this is setting it right again. This is kind of, you know, putting it back in balance. And so we can't be afraid to do that, to be able to humble ourselves before one another, because it is through that ultimate humility of Christ, taking on human flesh, dying on the cross that we find that the power and the strength and the love of God. So that's uh, an important part of it. Being a parishioner also means to be humble. So it means to be humble. It needs to be full of love. It needs to be full of joy. It needs to be, you know, and, and not, not that we're walking around like we're brainwashed or something, but it's got to be true and genuine and comes, radiates with the joy of God. And then, my brothers and sisters, as we as we continue on this, we realize that only then, if we, after we are sent to myself and I am sent to my family, then we can start talking about being sent to the world, and that world being, you know, whatever, however you want to define it. You know, um, let's take it in this sense: the world of our parish, right? The world that God places us in, you know. But that parish is that particular world. And so how am I going to deal with that? If, and if I've got myself and my family in order, then I can also be so much more of a better parishioner, a better Christian, a better part of a community. You know, um, you know, be a witness and a shining light of what Christian is and what is believed. You know, and that's just not in your community or at your work or wherever that world may be that you define, but also in your parish, you know, be consistent on that. You know, and how I'm gonna act here is how I'm acting 
at home, how I'm acting with myself. It's all consistent. You know, how you deal with people, Father Hop goes, goes on in that article, you know, lovingly, justly, honestly, with patience and kindness and gentleness and purity. Isn't that a beautiful way to think about it? You know, that we can, we can re deal with each other in this wonderful and beautiful way and that it's not just something that's forced or, or, or makes us do, but it's actually something that's true and real and coming from within ourselves. And so uh, being a parishioner means to be able to do, to bring that there. Um, Father Hopko actually goes on in, in this, and it's very interesting how, how he puts this, you know, because he, he kind of expands that from being, you know, the, the work of the Christian laity, you know, within your church, but he thinks of it also in a more macro sense, you know, what does it mean? to be the laity in the world, in your, in your job, in your profession, you know, uh, how you interact with other people, because that absolutely is not only just a witness that you, you are truly a Christian, but it's also an incredibly important part of how we think of ourselves and present ourselves. So uh, he said, he goes so far as to say, you know, you will be given, you'll be, you will have to give an account of how you performed your chosen profession. And that means whether you're a, you know, a, a janitor or a farmer or a priest or a lawyer or whatever it may be, that's your chosen profession. And you will be called to give account for that. You know, in other words, you know, the way you act at home and in church should be the way that you act in your job. Right. It should, you should be that way. You should you should live that type of way and uh, you will be given an account of it. So, you know, if you're in a, you know, whatever your profession is, you do it honestly and you do it, uh, you know, and don't go into professions that are not honorable and honest and respectable, um, that you live that life as a Christian. Not in, in a hidden way and certainly not in an obnoxious, overbearing way but in a way that's consistent, in a way that, that, is, that is true. And so, you know, express your faith and your love for God and their fellow human beings in your daily work. That doesn't mean I'm going to go out there and say, do you believe in Jesus? You know, you, that's not at all what it means. It means that you're going to be a witness by the way you live your life, the way you speak, the way you work, the way you do anything. That's your witness. You know, how can you how can you live and say you're a Christian and then engage, for example, in office gossip? You know, or or to go with some underhanded way to get rid of someone from the work or treat someone poorly because you don't like them. Because in the end, that that will come through. But yet to be a parishioner is the same way. Why would we act any different in a parish than we would at our job? And why would we act any different in a parish as we would with our family? Or how would we act any, you know, you could just take that all in, in any way. It all has to be that consistent thing. And, and when we act and, and, and live and shine with that light in all areas of our life, then that's the strength and the power and the beauty of being a Christian. It's a narrow way of life, right? Matthew 7, 4. It's a narrow way of life being a Christian. And we've chosen that narrow way. And it's it's difficult. There are times when you are just going to be, you want to lose it with somebody or you want to do whatever. We can't. We have to walk that narrow path. Um, <laughs> there, there, there was a question that, that had come up a while ago, I was talking to someone, you know, doing some catechism, and you know, and, and the question was, "Am I an Orthodox Christian or am I a Christian?" Well, there shouldn't be a difference necessarily. I mean, Orthodox is the way in which we express our Christianity and the truth that we see in being a Christian, but it's an important part, you know, that we are Christian. We're very good at making people Orthodox. Sometimes we're not so good at making people Christian. And so we have to act and, and live and be a Christian because there is no contradiction, by the way, between being an Orthodox Christian and a Christian. It's all the same thing. 
but we need to be consistent in how we do that. Um, and again, not just through words, but through actions. And it's, it's, it, this is an interesting thing. And, and you'll find this, and this, this comes from John 18, 36, I think. It's, it's also the title of many different things. You know, we have to be in this world, but we don't have to be of this world. And I think that's incredibly important for us to remember that. You know, we have to live in this world. It's, it's the world that God has given us. You, you know, it's the stewardship of this world. We have to be here. It doesn't mean we have to be of it. We don't have to let it control us. We don't have to see that we fall into its traps, which are many. And so um, we are a different type of people. You know, we are part of that. So that we would be truly Christian because we're looking for the resurrection. We're looking for salvation. So how we deal with that in our lives is incredibly important. Um, I'll quote again from Hopko. It is a church in which the Holy Spirit brings God's truth in Christ to the body of believers through prayers and the spiritual feats of the saints. The Orthodox Church is a church in which the human person discovers God's truth by bearing each other's burdens, hearing each other's words, sharing each other's experiences, correcting each other's faults, and benefiting from each other's wisdom. So if we want to really take it down and boil that essence down of all that we've discussed and we've gone and had a kind of a wide net here, it comes down to that, you know, that we are a church in which we want to discover God's truth. And we do that by bearing each other's burdens, which can be difficult at times. Hearing each other's words, like really hearing, not just listening, but hearing what the other person is saying. Sharing our experiences so that we grow stronger through that. Correcting with love each other's faults and benefiting from each other's wisdom. And so when we think about that, you know, again, going back to like the responsibilities of a priest and responsibility of laity, then it becomes much more clear, right? This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is how we're supposed to be living. So again, there isn't this sort of cookie cutter sort of answer. Unless you want to look at the statutes, you know, to be a member of the church, you have to uh, be baptized and chrismated in the church. You have to have received confession and communion once a year, be over 18 years of old, old and uh, support your church whatever way, your parish in every way that's determined financially. That is very cold and legalistic. We need to step backwards on that and think about what it is that we're doing how it is that we're participating in that life of Christ. You know, for many of us who may have grown up in the Orthodox Church, we take a lot of this for granted. Or we just sort of think that's the normal way in which the church is functioning or dysfunctioning. When in fact, that's not at all what it's meant to be. But when you truly find the light of Christ shining strongly, powerfully, radiantly, then you see the possibilities of what it can be. And so you as a parishioner, me as a parishioner, are absolutely responsible for how that's going to be in the parish. When you walk through those doors, your responsibility is to God and your responsibility is to yourself. Your responsibility is to your family. All these things are there. It's a heavy weight but as christ says the yoke is light um i think if i would give any bit of advice it's, it's that same bit of advice be consistent you know be consistent in how you live how you are with yourself how you are with your family how you are at your work how you are with the people that you meet be consistent because that consistency will carry over into the church and into the parish and then you will find a much more peaceful way of being a parishioner and a much more joyful way of being a parishioner and again no one is saved alone no one can be a christian by their own we need one another even god is a community the father son and holy spirit and so um, 
we need to be in that parish. We need to participate in that life of that parish. We can't be some sort of passive sort of uh, audience to the liturgy. We can't be a passive audience to our own life. We have to be a part of it. We have to be engaged in it. We have to be engaged in our own life and our own ways of thinking. Because if we're not, then again, why bother coming? You know, you can, you can, you can watch it on TV. And that's not the point of it. We have to do what we can do now, but to gather together in communion with one another. Love, peace, and strength, etc., etc., etc. I'm going to finish this up with a quote um, from St. Theophon the Recluse. And uh, St. Theophon the Recluse, it's always fascinating. I, you know, he, he's a recluse, right? But yet he's talking about living in a community. He's a recluse, and yet he's talking about how to raise children. He, he, he's, he's quite remarkable in that sense. So uh, the final goal of man, and I would put a little parenthesis, being a parishioner, is communion with God. The path to this communion has been precisely defined. Faith and walking in the commandments with the help of God's grace. So my brothers and sisters, that's how you be a parishioner. It's faith, walking in the commandments with God's grace. That will allow us to focus in. So with that being said, we'll end today's Orthodoxy 101 class on how to be a parishioner. I hope we learned something, and I hope it gives us a chance for some self-reflection on how it is that we're, we're treating one another, how we're treating the church, you know, uh, how we're treating our, our job, however it may be. Next week, we'll talk about discipleship and um, what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And that's, this will kind of complete that sort of journey that we've been taking over this month about the parish and parish life and being a parishioner and you know, stewardship and also now being a disciple of Christ. So have a good evening and take care. God bless you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.